Praise the Lord. If you're saved, you have been changed. Amen? I want to tell you what a thrill it is to be here today. I know that today is Senior Saint Sunday. Today is the day where we take a moment and we just thank the seniors for what they've done in this church all through the years. I said this in the first service. I'm going to say it in the second. One thing I love about First Baptist Church Barnwell, the seniors that we have here, none of them have ever come to me since I've been here this long three months and have ever said, well, you know, I've done my part. I'm, I'm done. I'm letting someone else do it. They're still working hard now as they did when they first came to Barnwell. Our seniors are jewels. Our seniors are loved. And our seniors have wisdom. Amen? Amen? God says that we need to love them and we need to cherish them. And I want you to hear from the pastor on behalf of this church that if you're a senior in here today, and I want you to know that number changes every year. The closer I get to 50, now you have to be a senior of 70. When I turn 55, a senior is 80. So as of right now, if you're 55 and older and you're a senior, which I don't know if I even agree with 55 now because it's getting a little closer, but we thank you for being a valuable addition to the body of Christ. We thank you for being able to come and not only worship with us on Sundays, but continue to work with us as we spread the gospel. One of the greatest things about the seniors in this church that I believe is when you get to that age, you get to start going to the young at heart trips. Now I get to go, they just went to one yesterday, I believe, and I, me and my wife, even though we're not to the age yet, we get to go to LaGrange, Georgia, and we get to be with the seniors on that trip, and I'm looking so forward to doing that. But I want to tell you, it's an honor and a blessing. And today I was trying to think of what we could do to honor you. Who could we get up here that would just bless you? And it's like God answered from heaven. Today our guest speaker, in honor of our senior saints today, is Lieutenant Governor Kevin Bryant. Not only is he the Lieutenant Governor for the uh, state, he is also in charge of the aging, the offices of aging here in the state of South Carolina, and he'll explain a little bit to you, that to you when he comes up. But it's been an honor to know this man, it's been an honor to get to know him and his wife, she is here today, Ann, and I just want you to know that the first service, he was a blessing. I know that this service, he's going to be a blessing. He is a true man after God's own heart. I found out something in the last hour. Not only does he come to churches and he speaks, but at his own church, he gets up and he speaks on a routine basis to be able to share the love of Christ and what God has shared in his heart. Isn't it nice to see that politicians are still running and have God in their heart and they're sharing that in every aspect of their governorship in every aspect of their office. Amen? Amen? So with that being said, would you please give a warm, warm invitation as Lieutenant Governor Kevin Bryant comes forward. Good morning. Good morning. How is everyone? It is wonderful to be here at First Baptist Church in Barnwell. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here to share with you. I'm Kevin Bryan. I'm your lieutenant governor until the end of the year, and then I will be unemployed. <laughs> but I do have another job. Now, y'all are really blessed to have Pastor Bart here. I can tell that he really loves you. He's committed to God's word. He's committed to the love of Christ. But let me tell you what kind of speaker he brought this morning. I'm also a pharmacist. I have a drugstore in Anderson. So this morning, the pastor has invited a guest speaker that is not only a politician, he's a drug dealer. <laughs> he has really gotten to the bottom of the barrel. But no, seriously, it is great to be here. And the lieutenant governor's office has one agency. It is the Office on Aging. And our simple mission is to help seniors stay home. Seniors want to be home as long as possible. Families of seniors want them at home as long as possible. And the future generations, and I want to reach out to the young folks here, cut your phone off for just a few moments today. Reach out to, a, if you have a family member or, of a senior, or reach out to the one of the seniors here, and just stop and listen to the wisdom that they can share with you the life lessons that they've learned the hard way, sometimes. 
I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. But that's what the Office on Aging does. So when we help seniors stay home, maybe it's one or two meals a week, maybe it's some transportation, but when we help seniors stay home, it's good for the senior, they want to be home. It's good for the families, they need them at home and all the wisdom to the future generations. But when you compare the cost of the limited resources we have to assisted living or skilled nursing care, it's also good for the taxpayer. It's good for the taxpayer to help seniors stay home. Uh, my wife, Ann, as Pastor Bart uh, recognizes here with me this morning, waved everybody, Ann. And when you meet her, if you see her and if you get a chance to meet her, you're going to wonder what in the world was she thinking 29 years ago when she said, I do. Well, you know, politicians are good at sticking their foot in their mouth, right? Y'all know that. Well, this morning I told my little joke about that, but I said 39 years, and then I got that look. Any married men in this? Raise your hand if you're a married man. Y'all know what that look means, don't you? Well, I got that look, and she was going, she was mouthing, it's 29. Now, she may think it seemed like 39, but I've been blessed to have Ann as my wife for 29 years. We have three children and a daughter-in-law. And I also want to mention Ann's father, his name's Clarence Baranowski, he started the Good News Network. If you're familiar with FM 99.1, that is part of the Christian Network radio station that he has all across the southeast, uh, WHBJ 99.1, which is a very good source for good biblical solid teaching and good biblical music. Would like to um, thank you for having me here on Senior Saints Day, and as Part of my responsibility running on Office on Aging, it's, it's a blessing to be here, and I appreciate y'all recognizing how valuable seniors are to our community. I would like uh, for everyone, if you have your Bible, if not, I can read for you in 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. There are literally thousands of pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. This story of Mephibosheth, personally, is my favorite. You may have another favorite. Maybe you've heard this story of Mephibosheth, maybe not. But we're going to talk about a fellow named Mephibosheth. 2 Samuel chapter 9, I'll start in verse 1. David, this is King David, asked, Is there anyone left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there, one, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, he is lame in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. Ziba answered, He is in the house of Maker, King James, you may have Mashur, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Maker, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay honor to him. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to you, that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table." Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's stewards, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in 
crops that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Verse 11, Now Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servants to do. Verse 12, Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. I have found four ways that the gospel can relate to us and the story of Mephibosheth. The first one is Mephibosheth was born in the wrong family. Saul was the previous king. David was the new king. David could have, and like most kings would have, killed every single person that was in the former king's family because he may have seen them as a threat. If not killed, he may have had them arrested. Mephibosheth was born in the wrong family. How does that relate to us? We are born in the wrong family family. We are born with a sin nature deserving of eternal punishment in hell. Lots of people talk about the goodness of mankind. The goodness of man. The goodness of mankind. That's not true. We are born in sin deserving of hell. Anybody here ever have to learn how to sin? No. It became natural because that's the nature you were born with. And with a holy, righteous, pure, perfect God, we cannot have fellowship in our sinful state. Jeremiah 17 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We're born in the wrong family. My second point is we are helpless. Remember, Mephibosheth was lame in both his feet. He had to be carried by somebody to ever get anywhere. We saw where the order was that they were going to bring the crops out of the property they gave him and bring that to Mephibosheth. He was purely helpless, could not do anything on his own. How are we helpless? In Romans 5... We are told, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. See, we're born in a sinful state in the wrong family. We are helpless. We can't save ourselves. This notion that you do more good works than bad works is a lie. It's not true. You cannot do enough good to earn your salvation. The good things that you do in your sinful state, God says, your righteousness, our righteousness is as filthy rags. So just like Mephibosheth being lame in his feet and and helpless in the physical sense, we are helpless in the spiritual sense. I know... You don't have Awana here, but a lot of you probably have heard of a children's program called Awana. And I remember one of the illustrations in Awana. It's a gospel program for children. And and Ann and I uh, were involved with that uh, several years ago. One of the examples was to save yourself is about as silly as telling yourself you can jump to the moon. If I stood here and I got some of the young fellows and we all lined up and we all tried to jump to the moon, well, I'm not going to get off the ground too far and maybe might be someone else 
probably could jump a little higher. We might have a basketball player that might could jump several inches off the floor. But we're nowhere near the moon, and we come right back where we started for. We can't save ourselves, and we are born deserving an eternity in hell. Third point, King David fetched out Mephibosheth. The king sent after Mephibosheth. Well, in John 3, familiar passage, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God, the creator, the perfect, holy, righteous God, who cannot associate with sinful people, sent his only and begotten son, and Jesus Christ came to us. He came from heaven. He left his throne. He became a man, lived a perfect life, and was punished for every single one of our sins. Jesus Christ loved us so much he took the wrath. We read about God's wrath in Romans 5. He took the wrath of God to pay for our sins. Just like the king fetched out Mephibosheth, the king of the universe fetches us out. And the last point is Mephibosheth sat at the king's table continually. Not only does the redemption of Christ keep us from going to hell. But if we're saved, if we know Him as Savior, God looks us at us as priests. And we will continually be with Him forever in heaven. Revelation 1 tells us, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I love that hymn. There's power in the blood. The blood of Jesus can take us from this sinful state and make us holy where we can spend eternity with God in heaven. Verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So, look at this. You would think maybe King David would have been, he would have shown some mercy to possibly let Mephibosheth off the hook. Let him live would have been good, right? To just let him live would have been something. But he went, found Mephibosheth, brought him to himself and said, Mephibosheth is going to sit at my table continually. That's just like us. Jesus Christ's blood would have been great if it only kept us from hell. But not only that, if you understand and believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior for your sin, not only will you not go to hell, you'll spend an eternity at the king's table. Four points. Wrong family, that's us, born in sin. Helpless, absolutely. We can't save ourselves. Fetched, that's my favorite word. Jesus Christ fetched us out and brought us to himself. And we will be treated as a child of the creator of this universe. You know, redemption can get somewhat complicated. I can't quite understand how God would love us so much when we're born his enemies and how his son, who is God, would love us so much to take that punishment to save us. I don't understand that. But you know what? God doesn't require us to understand Him. He says with childlike faith, this is what you're expected to believe. I came to know Christ in third grade, and I remember, it's been a while, I'm getting on up there, I've passed 50 Simple childlike faith, I was told I was a sinner deserving of hell. I was told that Jesus paid for my sins, and with childlike faith, I accepted that. So i tell you this. If you know Christ, now I've been a Christian for a long time, and you may not be like me, but sometimes we like to pat on ourselves on the back on how good we are and how we live a clean life. 
Well, you know we're not. We're just washed up sinners. That's why it's very important, even for Christians, to always look back at the gospel. If you don't know Jesus as Savior, the price has been paid, a very expensive price. The blood of Christ has been paid to purchase you. So if you have never come to the realization that you are a sinner, it is a fact. If you've never admitted that, if you've never come to the realization that Christ died for your sins, you can know the King today by simply making that profession. Now, redemption may be complicated, but the gospel's pretty easy to understand, isn't it? We're sinful, and we have a Savior. Pastor Bart, I appreciate our time this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to, to, be able to share a little bit of God's Word with you, and I, and I hope that by opening up the Scriptures, you've been encouraged. Thank you so much. You know, at the end of every service, I like to give a call.